Hello, and thank you for watching. Uh, I'm Professor Ryan Paul of Texas A&M University, Kingsville, and you are watching my lecture on King John by Shakespeare, uh, specifically on Act Two of King John. I want to begin by framing the discussion of this act and the play as a whole with the question, what is a nation? What makes a nation? A nation defined by the geography, the land and physical borders, is a nation defined by the government? If so, who makes up the government? The people, the elites, a king? Is a nation defined by a language, a culture, a series of social practices? Is a nation made up of a people, a group of citizens or subjects? And if so, who counts as a person? Who counts as a subject? These are questions that we ask and debate today. They're very important to our current political issues, uh, but they were also questions uh, that were very important in the 16th century, in Shakespeare's time. And they were questions that were important in the 13th century, in King John's time, when this play is set. So we talked about in class uh, an interesting omission on Shakespeare's part, that what we know King John, the historical king, uh, most for, and what Shakespeare's peers probably knew King John most for, was the signing of the Magna Carta, which I'll talk about very briefly in a moment. But Shakespeare doesn't refer to that in this play. But I'm going to argue that the Magna Carta is, in a sense, behind Shakespeare's play, even though it's not explicitly mentioned. Um, it's a sort of spectral presence, a ghost haunting it. Now, what do I mean when I say that it's a presence in the play. Do I mean that Shakespeare was intending us to think about the Magna Carta or that there was an allegorical reference, there's some coded reference to the Magna Carta in the play? No, I'm not arguing that. That's Is that possibly the case? Sure, but that's not my argument. Um, am I arguing that behind any reference to King John, there would have been in Shakespeare's mind, in his peers' mind, in his audience's mind, in our minds, the reference to, to the Magna Carta. We would be aware of that as a connection, even if it was only to say, oh yeah, King John, he was the, the king that signed the Magna Carta. So that's there, even just as, a, as an association, but also in the sense that the Magna Carta, the signing of the Magna Carta, was an experiment in nation building and was an important moment, at least as we interpret now historically, an, interpret, an important moment in the development of modern constitutional democracy. So that's to say that the Magna Carta is in part creating the context in which any interpretation or any, any understanding of the King John story by Shakespeare, by us, is possible. We read the play King John, the, the play King John is written in a post-Magna Carta world. That's not to say that it's the decisive historical context the defining moment through which we should interpret this play. Rather, it's a point against which we can read this play, against which we can sort of triangulate it, a perspective which we can bounce our understandings of this play off of. Let me explain what I mean a little bit by talking very briefly about the Magna Carta. Now, I'm not a historian, and I'm certainly not a historian of the 13th century, um, and there's plenty of resources out there for you to uh, look up about King John and the Magna Carta and encourage you to do so. Uh, for those of you at my institution who have access to Canopy, uh, the video streaming service through uh, our library, there's a great documentary on it. And I advise you watch that because you get, I recommend that you watch that because it'll present you with a far more in-depth understanding of the Magna Carta that I can in the brief time that I'm going to devote to it here. But in brief, the Magna Carta was a concession on King John's part to the nobles of England, a power-sharing agreement in some sense. So this hybridization of power is interpreted, again, by many historians as a major step towards the development of constitutional democracy, modern constitutional democracy. This is one, and this is, I think, an important reason why Shakespeare and his contemporaries would have been interested in the history of King John. Because during the reign of the Tudors, Queen Elizabeth I and her predecessors, England saw further centralization of power, further sort of hybridization of power between the, the nobles and the monarch, um, and further developments towards constitutional democracy. 
Now, I'm not saying, again, that the Magna Carta was the definite cause of these. The, the arguments and explanations for why these changes took place are far more complex. But I'm saying they are in a narrative that includes the Magna Carta, where the Magna Carta is an important story, um, both historically and in the imagination of Shakespeare and his contemporaries, and of course, uh, in the imagination of us as well. The transformation took place through, on the one hand, uh, centralization of power in the court of the monarch, and on the other hand, that power counterbalanced by a centralized, um, pseudo-democratic or republican, uh, re pseudo-representative parliament made up of a House of Lords and House of Commons. The House of Lords being, again, primarily nobility, uh, representatives of major aristocratic families, House of Commoners being the lower status elite, the up, up and coming gentlemen and so forth, um, and minor nobles and, and representatives of the citizenry. Now, the way I've put it makes it sound very neat and simple. In reality, it was far more complex and it wasn't, power was not so neatly divided. And again, the development was not a neat progression from A to B. It's not a, a simple evolution but rather a complex struggle between various forces and personalities and factions. So at the same time as we have this development towards a more formal system of government, we might say, and again, a hybridized system of government where we have representatives of different aspects of the population, the monarchy, the nobility, the minor, uh, the gentry, the, the citizenry, although again, only a part of that citizenry, this isn't uh, rep fully represented democracy by any means. But at the same time as we have that, it's still stratified by personal rivalries, um, family uh, rivalries, personal ambitions, um, and of course the instability of a central authority figure that is based in heredity, right? That we have a monarch where the, the executive power, the central power, and in some sense, the defining figure of the nation is dependent on family lineage and reproduction. That's always gonna be an anxious issue. And of course that issue is exacerbated by the fact that in Shakespeare's time, uh, when this play was written around 1595, 1596, Queen Elizabeth was past childbearing years, had had no children and had not named an heir. So there was always, of course, the fear that if she died without a, a, an heir in place, the country could be plunged into civil war and disorder. We saw in Shakespeare's earlier history plays, the first tetralogy of Henry VI plays and Richard III, Shakespeare dramatized the War of the Roses, which was the civil war that tore England apart prior to the, uh, the rise of the Tudor dynasty. And that erupted over the question of the legitimacy of the monarch, who is the legitimate claim to the monarch. King John returns to that question of who is a legitimate ruler. This question of legitimacy, as we discussed in class, is played out, however, in a play that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, the plot that is. Um, it's a play, as we talked about, of seeming non sequiturs, rapid and apparently unmotivated reversals, betrayals, double betrayals, uh, families put against each other, nobles put against their nation, unexpected alliances, all these sorts of strange um, events that happen without any, seemi, any seeming, without any seeming rhyme or reason. The thread that unites all these issues, I think, is the thread of disjunction, the idea of disjunction, discontinuity. This internal conflict on the domestic and political realm is echoed by the disjunction in narrative, the way events unfold in unexpected ways, seeming, uh, again, events out of nowhere. The rapid, unexpected shifts of fortune, the um, seemingly uh, insignificant events that come back to have uh, major sort of major consequences. The scene, all these disjunctions in the plot, in the way events unfold, uh, are an echo, I think, or a reflection of the disjunction, the political disjunction, the political divide. And this extends even into the personal, into the individuals, where we see people split against themselves, Constance being the one most famously who um, goes mad, is torn apart.
all the unexpected alliances and betrayals and unions and double betrayals. These are attempts to cobble together some sort of meaning, some sort of government, some sort of structure, some sort of nation. And we see them falling apart and being reconstructed due to random contingencies. So we can think of them as experiments of a sort, experiments in nation building, attempts to cobble together a hybrid government, a form of government that's legitimate, that somehow unites the disparate forces, the disparate opinions, the disparate desires, the conflicting passions and personalities into a whole, into a legitimate government, a structure that has meaning that could be England. So the incoherency of the plot reflects the stilted, complicated, stumbling, roundabout, backward and forward process of building a nation. And I think it challenges the idea of a nation as a thing. They challenge the idea that a nation can be a stable being, can be a, a unified whole. So with these ideas in mind, let's turn to Act Two of King John. What I want to do is lead us through a reading of this act, considering it through this perspective or from this perspective of conflict and resolution, or the attempt to graft together from disparate forces, conflicting desires and ambitions, some sort of union that can represent a, a singular whole, a nation, and the forces that tear those unions apart and then a force uh, and then attempt to reconstruct them in new forms, new alliances, uh, new arrangements. Now I'm using the uh, edition from the Arden, Shakespeare, and Act Two in this edition has two scenes. The first scene is the long scene before Angiers, and the second scene is the scene of Constance learning about the alliance that... I'll review what's brought us to Angiers. In Act One, France sent an ambassador to King John and challenged him on behalf of his nephew Arthur and her mother Constance for the right to the throne. They claim that John is a usurper and that Arthur is the rightful king as his father was John's elder brother. Jonathan defies France and vows to fight for his right to rule. The questions of legitimacy and inheritance are then played out again in a second conflict that's more localized and both more humorous, and that's the debate between the Falconbridge brothers, their conflict over who is the rightful heir to their father's inheritance. We have the elder Philip, who claims inheritance by right of his status as the elder son, and then the younger Sir Robert, who claims his right of inheritance based on his father's will, saying his father disinherited the elder brother because he is a bastard. In fact, that he is another nephew of King John, son of, bastard son of King John's eldest brother, the deceased Richard Coeur de Lyon, Richard Lionheart. So we'll recall that in a surprising move, John rules that even if Philip is the bastard son of Richard, that's no bar to his legitimate inheritance. He st was still born in wedlock, even if the mother cheated and he's not Sir Robert's, uh, the heir of Sir Robert's flesh, that doesn't matter. He still gets the inheritance, that's the law, and it triumphs over the will of, um, of the will of the father, his legal will and metaphorically his intention, his will. And then even more surprisingly, Philip the Bastard decides, I'm going to give up this inheritance to follow King John and to take the name of Coeur de Lyon to take up my place as Richard the Lionheart's son, not the eldest son of Sir Robert. So this scene is very strange in that the characters behave in rather unexpected, almost irrational ways, and the outcome is not at all what we would expect, and not at all for the reasons that we would expect. Before we look at the language of Act Two, Scene One, let me re recount the events. We begin before the city of Angiers and the King of France introduces Arthur to their newest ally, the Archduke of Austria. They're interrupted by Chatillon, their ambassador to England, who arrives to say that King John is here to wage war to defend his right to the English throne. And no sooner has he said that than King John arrives. 
After a bit of verbal sparring between various partners, the two forces confront the ends the city of Angiers, each demanding that Angiers open its gates to them as the rightful king, or on Philip's side, the representative of the rightful king of England and these territories in France. Hubert, the first citizen of Angiers, Hubert, the first citizen of Angiers, refuses, saying that Hubert, the first citizen of Angiers, Hubert, the first, mm. Hubert, 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 the first citizen of Angiers, answers to them that they will not open the gates except to the rightful king, and it's up to them to decide between themselves who the rightful king is. So the forces of England and France engage in battle, and each claims victory. But Hubert again responds, neither of you has defeated the other, there is no clear winner, there is no clear king. At this point, the bastard steps in offering his opinion that the people of Angiers are defying these kings, mocking them. He suggests that John and Philip join their forces together to destroy Angiers and then fight over its rubble. John and Philip jump at this rather perverse suggestion and decide to join forces to assault the city, along with the Archduke of Austria. But before they can destroy Angiers, Hubert makes a suggestion a rather self-serving suggestion to save himself and his city from possible destruction. He says, why don't you two ally yourselves through marriage, and then we will open the gates to you. Blanche, the nephew, or excuse me, the niece of King John, is the same age as Louis, the Dauphin of France, the, the heir to the French throne. Why not marry them? And this may seem odd, but this is a political marriage. He's offering them a cynical way out of their conflict to join together through this marriage, and in doing so, save himself. So both sides pretty quickly agree to the marriage, and there's various concessions back and forth to unite them together. It ends up, ultimately, the upshot is John's um, right as king is upheld, Arthur is subordinated to his authority, France is now his ally, and France gets some additional territories under their uh, rule through the alliance with Blanche, through the marriage to Blanche. And the scene ends with the bastard alone on stage, cynically commenting on self-interest and how it warps the natural bias of the world.